My name is Amy Heller, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm co-founder of Milestone Films, and I'm a board member of the new organization, Missing Movies. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting tonight on the traditional territory of the Wappinger and Muncie Lenape people. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about a problem that many of us all have encountered, um, wanting to see a particular movie, but finding no way to actually watch it. Our organization grew out of um, our own personal and professional experiences struggling with just this dilemma. And we thank the 60th New York Film Festival and HBO for making this evening possible. Okay, so what is a missing movie? What qualifies as a missing movie? So that's something we, that we have and continue to debate, and I'm sure we all will be discussing some of the gray areas, but here are five basic questions that we ask when we're trying to figure out if a film is missing or not. One, is the film available to watch online by the general public, you know, either, either through a subscription streaming service, a downloadable link, a one-time rental, or for free? Is the film available on DVD or Blu-ray or Ultra HD Blu-ray? Is the price to buy the disc or screen the film online affordable? Is the disc or online, or online screener of good quality? And is the disc or online screener being made available legally? You know, basically, are the filmmakers being compensated? So if there is a crappy pirate VHS upload on YouTube, or if it is available on an illegal BitTorrent site, we would still label that movie as missing. When we began to meet and to think about the problem of lost films, each of us was, were focused on films, genres, and time periods that we knew best. But as we broadened our inquiries, we realized just how many motion pictures are no longer available. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Cinema history goes back to the 19th century, and there are lost films from every decade, including the 2020s. I started compiling our big list of missing movies by going through films that screened at festivals. But I quickly realized that we need to be looking for films that flew under the radar. Uh, films that we don't even know exist. These are short films, animation, documentaries, indie features, and they include films by women, by African Americans, Native Americans, students, rural people, members of the LGBTQ community. And just because a film failed to get attention when it was originally made does not mean it does not have a lot to offer audiences now. Tomorrow night, at, um, my company's film, Losing Ground, is opening at the IFC Center in a new 4K restoration. But when the filmmaker, Kathleen Collins, finished the film in 1982, she couldn't get it shown or distributed. Things change, and we want to help change them. So, films get lost for a lot of different reasons. Almost an infinite number of different reasons. Tonight, Nancy Wolf, an entertainment lawyer specializing in copyright issues, and filmmakers Nancy Savoka and Rich Gay will be talking about the legal problems that keep many films out of distribution. Um, my husband and partner, Dennis Doros, will be exploring the way that filmmakers, distributors, and archives can and do work together to locate, restore, and preserve the film elements needed to create high-def digital transfers and longtime distributor and producer Ira Deutschman, and Maya Cade, creator of the Great Black Film Archive Online, will discuss the challenges that missing movies post, pose for distributors and for programmers. But because this is about movies, I'm gonna show you a two-minute movie and tell you about how it was lost and found. So yeah, we can start it, Rich. So. I thought we'd, uh, this is a copyright discussion, but uh, I thought putting the entire presentation in context, I want to talk about a missing movie of our own, Nancy Savoka and I. This is Nancy Wolf from Town Debates, copyright uh, expert. Um, 
we, you know, I'll, I'll let Nancy Savoka start the, 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 the talk with uh, what happened and how we, so how we sort of came to here and how we sort of yeah. got involved with the missing movies. So we're, we're filmmakers and film lovers like you guys are. So we've had the frustration of trying to find you know, a movie that we really wanted to see and then we couldn't find it. So that was, you know, we had that idea in the back of our mind, but it didn't really hit home <laughs> until um, summer of 2018 when Ira Deutschman, whom you're gonna meet in a moment, um, who uh, called us to say, I'd like to screen a, a print of your movie Household Saints, which we all with Ira had made together in 1993. And uh, you probably hear, you know, in the 90s, that was like the golden age of indie films. So a lot of indie films got made, and we were one of those lucky films that got made. Um, it's the golden age of um, indie films, but also perhaps the age when um, it was the heyday of content for home video, which was another reason why those films got made. So anyway, we made this movie, and we said, sure, I want you want to screen it. I know that there's two prints at the UCLA Film Archives, and um, we knew of those prints being there for, for a while, and so I recalled UCLA Film Archives, and they said, we're gonna check the prints, because they hadn't really started running through, and they screened them and found that both of the prints that they had of Household Saints were damaged, so they were unscreenable. So we went from thinking we had two prints somewhere safely in an archive to we have nothing. Uh, sent us in a bit of a panic. And, and so, um, this is also a, a trademark of missing movies. Uh, Household Saints was made by uh, a combination of Fine Line, uh, which was a new label of New Line uh, films, and that Ira was the head of. Uh, new Line International, which was the foreign side of New Line. Uh, Columbia TriStar Home Video, and an equity investor. Um, and we'll come back to that equity investor in a second when we talk about copyright. Uh, but fine, uh, New Line was sold to Warner Brothers, so my f first call was to the Warner Brothers vault to find out what they had, and I was initially told they had nothing because they no longer had distribution rights. And I said, what happened to the materials? And I was told by whoever answered the phone that well, they were probably destroyed. So now we didn't have a print, and we did not know where the, where, where the elements were. Um, I called Ira, and Ira was able to, again, uh, knowing all the players, Ira was able to reach uh, the, I, I don't remember who it was he reached, but it was a top creative uh, executive, uh, basically the head of New Line at, at, uh, at Warner Brothers, and got them to call the vault, and the vault, I, I then, the next day, got a phone call from the, uh, from the head of the, the, uh, the vault, the, 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 the head guy, and he said, all he said to me was, yeah, we don't have the rights anymore, but I got 100 boxes, where do you want them? And I, I was thrilled that he had them, and I thought, nowhere, I don't have a, you know, my one bedroom is not gonna hold this. So um, we were very fortunate, again, uh, you know, I I'll high underline these, these fortunate moments, because Nancy's archives, or at the University of Michigan, and I was able to make a, f a couple of phone calls and get them to actually accept delivery of, of all these materials. So that was finding the materials. Now the other piece of the missing movie is the rights and the copyright holder, and that's where we, we, we start with, uh, with that. And going back to the deals, the equity investor owned the copyright that was part of their their, their interest in, the, in, in investing was they wanted the, the, the copyright, the so-called library uh, a building. Uh, and this company, though, only built a library of two films. Uh, mine was one. And basically was folded into other companies that had all been dissolved. The owner of all of this uh, had passed away. And so, lucky break number three or four for me was I knew who the other film belonged to, and it was John Sayles. It was a movie called The Secret of Rowan Inish. And I reached out to Maggie Renzi, who told me who the contact was. They had recently bought back Rowan Inish. 
uh, which is why I believe it is in distribution now or coming very soon. And so, um, so that was the, the, you know, that was the journey. Now, I was able to reach out to these folks and who I was dealing with were uh, estate lawyers. Uh, and big surprise, they had a, this gentleman had a very large estate and probably the last thing on the list of all of the items in that estate was our film. So it took quite a while. The journey that I just described took three and a half years. Um, two and a half years wrapped up with the, uh, with the copyright. And this is with us knowing who the players were. And we, knew every, we, we basically knew all, a lot of information and had some inside uh, scoop. So having said that, this section is really about copyright. Um, so we'll, I'll ask Nancy to address a couple of the things. Let's talk about the specific copyright issues that, that uh, well, we're dealing with with film. Well, there's so many multiple layers of copyright with film. You mentioned um, one, like who actually owns the, the film as a whole right. itself. Um, and often it's owned by some company. And often these companies are created just for the purpose of creating one film and raising money. And so it isn't it, as if you're working with like right. a major corporation that's going to be around and you're going to have a legal department and someone to talk to. It's generally going to be, you know, a, a, a you know, a closely mm -hmm. held, like a, now it might be an LLC and then right. it might have been a company. Um, those, the, so those entities change so, and so they, they may have dissolved and once you stop paying taxes on a company, you, you just get dissolved. Even if you don't physically do it, the state will dissolve you. Right. So important to remember that the distribution of the film is different from the ownership, ownership right. of the film. Right. And, and then, then there's the paper trail. I mean, who did the rights of that film go to for distribution? And if you're looking at the 90s, this was before there, everything was done in paper. Where did those papers go? Where they save for tax reasons, people save things for six years. They could have all been dumped. Um, and and then, you, then there's more layers. Um, it's the rights in the film, often with indie films or documentaries, some smaller films, the budgets were lower, so they might not have gotten all the underlying rights in perpetuity. So when you look at a film, there, there's music rights. And generally, th those could have been licensed for a period of term for maybe 10 years, 20 years, because no one imagined at the time they'd be streaming these things forever and ever. Um, and, and music rights are really complicated, because when you have music with any audiovisual, you need sync rights, and you also need the underlying rights from the, uh, the, those who wrote the music and lyrics in addition to the mechanical rights, and it just goes on and on. And then you could have some um, third party rights in licensed footage or licensed still photos. And if you can't find all that kind of paperwork, you start not knowing if you can actually distribute everything you have. Right. So there's, uh, and this is when you even know who, who these are. There's sort of a, a copyright saying called orphan works, where you know a work is protected by copyright, but you either one can find the owner but can't find how to reach them or there's heirs and you can't reach them or you don't even know who the owners are anymore. Um, and there was a movement in the, actually I think it was uh, over 10 years ago or more, to try to have a, the Copyright Act actually change. So, um, all these types of works that could be used and, and for productive reasons um, without being risked, without the risk of being sued for copyright infringement. Because a lot of this has very low risk, but no one wants to take the risk to distribute and you can't get insurance and you can't get a distributor. Uh, and unfortunately, there was no change to the Copyright Act because what they wanted to do was make it that if you used a work and the owner came and, and emerge, and it was a real owner, that your damages would be limited to like a reasonable license fee. Um, but because so many visual artwork uh, doesn't have a name attached to it, and there's no requirement to have attribution with copyright, so a lot of the photographers and visual artists were afraid that their, their works would be, you know, immediately orphaned, and there was pushback mm -hmm. uh, on having any change. So unfortunately, um, there are other parts of the world that do have some 
relaxation for urban works, but we really don't, so it becomes a risk analysis. So, so what, do you, wh what are the potential solutions in terms of um, that, well, failure to properly clear underlying lights is a, uh, that's a big one. Um, and the, the issue is when you, if you have the rights to the film and you do get the rights from the owner, then you want a distribution agreement and you'll need to sign an agreement that says you represent and warrant that all the rights are there. Um, so I guess a contractual solution could be that you would want to indemnify some right. giant company, so that, that, which that is very the, scary. Right, you the right? filmmaker. You the filmmaker get to indemnify, right. or you can try to get insurance, and insurance companies are very risk averse, right. and I mean sometimes they do allow things like quick claims, or there is some, pr some insurance you can now get, errors and emissions for mm -hmm. things like fair use, but when you just have like lost all the underlying paperwork and don't know right. how risky things are, I these become the stumbling blocks sure. that prevent you from getting to the next step. Right, and, and the paperwork is a huge issue. I mean, I was we're very fortunate that, uh, that your firm uh, had documents from 30 plus years ago. Right, because I mean, we don't throw anything away. <laughs> these guys don't throw anything away, but right. a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of places do. Right, too. we may um, soon though. We're getting the bills from the storage place. And I think you basically covered the idea of the uh, sort of the unknown copyright, which is someone's got to take the risk, right? Someone's mm -hmm. got to yeah. take the, 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 the chance uh, of being sued. Right, right. And in many, many cases, it would probably be, could be very low risk. Um, but it, you just don't know. You know, it's, it's uh, right. and, and you're dealing with, particularly when you end up in distribution and you're, dealing with the big streaming companies, mm -hmm. they want no responsibility on them and all on you. So, right, right. so if you're going to stream with Netflix or anyone else. And yeah. is there any recourse for what I call hostage situations uh, where you've got a, uh, let's just call them a disinterested copyright holder, someone who's not interested in, in uh, e exploiting the work and doesn't want to doesn't want to move off, uh, you know, they don't want to do it. I mean, recently Kevin Smith was there's a headline somewhere. Kevin Smith talking about his film Dogma, which he said is being held hostage. Um, so, uh, any recourse there? There really not, because part of being a copyright owner is the right to say no, to say I don't want my work mm -hmm. exploited. So there's no like public right to have access to something. Right. Um, you can use, you know, parts of things sometimes under fair use. But if you're really being held hostage by the copyright owner, now, if that owner is one of multiple owners, you could maybe try to find the other owners to put pressure on. But, you know, I've had that experience even trying to clear music for a film where the minority, you know, author, minority, you know, writer um, who has the smallest percent wants an astronomical amount of money and then you can't afford to do it. Right. And they can do that. They can right. kill a whole deal. Because it's basically free market. Yeah. And, and they can set their own price. Yeah. Um, interestingly, music doesn't have that issue with covers, right? I mean, I can record someone's song and pay it. There's a, there's mm -hmm. a structure there for. Right. There's, there's the Copyright Act has um, collective licensing for music. The problem is that doesn't cover sync rights, and sync rights mm -hmm. are what you need when you combine music. Right with audiovisual. So if you're a band and you want to do a cover of the, the latest, you know, Adele song or something, you can do that. Right. You just pay a royalty that's set out in the Copyright Act. Right. And changing the Copyright Act is one of the hardest and longest things. It takes forever. There's a new Copyright Small Claims Board that just started last summer, and that took over 10 years, almost mm. 10 to 15 years. Interesting. Which is great, because actually if you do get a claim, you could see if they would voluntarily go to the Copyright Small Claims Board if it's for less than 30000 and right. you don't need a lawyer, but it okay. has to, it's voluntary. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the, the other thing that I've, we, we've did come upon in our research, and I'm actually aware of a number of filmmakers trying the, to, to go this way, is something called termination of copyright. Yes. Yeah. So termination is... Um, it's a part of our Copyright Act, which gives uh, an, a creator, an author, who may have entered into a deal, young in his or her career, an opportunity 
um, to terminate and make a better deal. Um, so it's this little window you get, and there's this window of notification and window of terminating, and it's, it's sort of approximately about 35 years into your copyright. The, the only quirk is that it doesn't apply to work for hire, and so many films are done under a corporate name that, and not an individual. So it, I think a lot of the Copyright Act was, I think, written sort of thinking of the publishing industry in mind. Parts of it is the film industry, which is why we have work for hire. But often authors of a book will you know, write a book in their own name. But it's, it's very rare that films are done in an individual name, and often they're done in a company name. So the argument always is, well, were you work for hire for this solely held company, or was it just there to collect your royalties or something like that? So that becomes part of the dispute. Um, but it is a, it's a go good tool for terminating rights. Um, right. uh, but it only would terminate ri U.S. rights. It would not terminate uh, foreign rights, and it would, yeah, so US, it's complicated. Right, U.S. rights, and you'd need an attorney. Uh, right, it's very, I mean, <laughs> I have the, the, the piece of the act with me because it makes your head spin to try to read it. Right. And if the author has passed away, you can go to the, the surviving spouse, right. children or grandchildren, and that's it. It's only at that 35-year mark. Well, there's Within there's windows. Window. There's windows. Yeah, yeah. There's five years, uh, like you know, starting with five years before 30 years of publication. And I actually would have to like literally read from this to get it accurate. Right. So, and that would put everyone here to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, we don't want to do that. The the only other thing I would ask you to if. People are not familiar with the term work for hire oh, and, and, yeah. and the idea of authorship being uh, corporate. Right. So, yeah, under many com companies, only an individual can be an author. But under U.S. law, there's certain situations where a company can be an author of a work. Um, the first one's kind of obvious when you're an employee and you work for someone and your job is to create something for that employee, they're going to own it. Um, the other is there's classes of classes of types of work where if there's a writing signed, um, you can agree that the work is work for hire. And a lot of it is intended for things like a film where you have a lot of parties that contribute to making the whole. So um, a film does qualify as a work for hire, um, but it has to be by contract, it has to be signed. So that's why director agreements are work for hire and actor agreements are work for hire right. and screenwriters. Because the other area a lot is in textbooks and things like that where you have lots of different authors that contribute to the final, like, you know, history of, of the, the world part two. And it's negotiable, of course, on the other side of the negotiation is you don't get the money. Right. You don't get paid unless That's you right. sign this. Or you don't get the money to make the movie. Right. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, I think that that's concludes our little section. Hey, good evening. And my name is Dennis Doris, and I'm have been preserving, restoring, and distributing moving images for the past 38 years, first with Kino International and then with Amy at Milestone Films. I am also a former president of the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Uh, I'm wearing their fancy little pin here. Uh, and with Amy, I'm co -cur current co-president of Missing Movies. Basically, they said, you don't make movies, you're around, you're going to be president. So. That's how the election went. So I'm here to tell you uh, that with all my experience and knowledge, any generalization that I make is going to be somewhat untrustworthy because every single instant in instance of preservation and restoration is so vastly different that there are no rules of thumb. So let me start with the most obvious statement possible for missing movies. The need for filmmakers to preserve and make accessible their moving images is paramount not only as a financial compensation for their work, but as importantly for the cultural and historical, historic fabric of our society. Even your family's home movies can tell you as much about a moment in time in our history as does the best years of our lives or leave it to beaver. In the past 30 years, the archival world has moved away from the belief of feature film as king or queen and has made room for all moving images to be valued and preserved. So, my favorite movie, moving image is a 44-second local Maine television news report from the 1970s of a Maine lobsterman. 
Every morning, he would haul in Addie Lou, the lobster, from one of the traps, and the crustacean would keep him company on his boat. He could tell the, her mood from the color of her speckles. Then he'd put her back in the ocean every, every evening. Uh, the lobster man narrates this piece in a very down, down east accent. Uh, the production values aren't much. Uh, the script is in by Billy Wilder. But it's something I watch when I want to remember why I'm in this business. It just moves me. Uh, and this was going to be a lost uh, film from local television. They were going to throw it out, but the Northeast Historic Film, one of the oldest and best of the uh, country's regional archives located in Bucksport, Maine, uh, saved this video, and I loved it so much they gave it to me as a present one year. Since we started mo missing movies, my new experiences have confirmed notions I've had over the years that preservation isn't taught in many of the film programs at colleges and universities, that filmmakers are so busy making their next film that they have little time to consider where their last film is being kept, that distributors and labs who are entrusted with the filmmakers' endeavors are also too busy with the latest releases to always give proper attention to older titles, that archives and archivists lack the sufficient financial means and staff to preserve that what they already have, much less the tsunami of moving images that our, this digital age have created. With the fragile nature of the moving image business these days, I don't know if you've seen the grosses, there's an even greater threat to the safety of our heritage. So um, how many of you are filmmakers here today? Cool. I'm going to be speaking to all of you. Uh, but also, this is how many of you own your family's home movies or will be owning your family's home movies? This is also for you because you are now an archive. You have your history that you have to preserve. So. If you're, uh, the following is to give you an idea of how much it takes to preserve a film. Here are some steps that I advise filmmakers what they need to know to, um, so the work does not become a missing movie. Number one, if your work has been made in the analog era, such as in film or in videotape, find out where your master materials are. For video, that means the earliest generation of the finished product. For a film, that includes the ca original camera negative, interpositive, internegative, home movies, prints, of course, and as, as, as importantly on film-based material, the optical and magnetic soundtracks to the film. Uh, when Sound One closed about 15 years ago, which was just a few blocks down from here, uh, they threw out thousands and thousands of mag tracks, the magnetic audio tracks, the masters to the films. And for me personally, this has been one of the greatest impediments to restoring New York films. Okay, number two. If you do have master materials for your film or video, do not keep them in your garage, closet, friend's house, storage unit, or anywhere that is not an archive experienced in storage, storing moving images. Amy and I have distributed films where irreparable irreplaceable materials uh, were lost and have had to make do. In one case, the original negative was lost in a barn fire. In another, a neighbor forgot to take 200 pounds of original audio tapes and DAT tapes to FedEx, left them in the shed by the side of the house about to be sold, and they were thrown out by the new owners. Other films we worked on uh, from filmmakers have been damaged by moisture, heat, dust, insects, rusts, you name it. So get your materials to an archive. Oh, we forgot. I was going to bring in a really bad 28 millimeter can from about the 1920s that looks disgusting, but thank you. You don't have to see it. But anything that you have, metal, plastic, everything, they will deteriorate and they will look like that in the next 10, 20 years if you don't store them properly. So please get them to an archive. Um, and do you need help finding one? Uh, missing Movies and the Association Moving Imager Archivists, as well as organizations like Sandra Schulberg's Indie Collect can help you. Uh, after this, you can ask us for names, contacts, anything. Uh, number three, if your film was created digitally, or if you have digital masters of your film-based materials, do not consider it safe just because you have it on multiple hard drives. The average hard drive lasts about five years. Get these files to an archive 
so they can properly store them on a long-term preservation, tape preservation, called LTOs, or linear tape open. And archives also continuously migrate them to updated servers and storage systems that constantly monitor their checksums to detect errors. If any of you are doing these at home, I'm really proud of you, but I don't, and I was the president of the Association of Moving Image <laughs> Archivists, so I get them to an archive. Number four, do not consider your film-based moving image, uh, images preserved just because you have them digitized. In just about over 30 years in business, we have had to, quote, restore films almost every 10 years. Uh, our first two acquisitions that we did in 1988, the silent films Chang and Grass, are currently now being restored for the fourth time. Technologies keep changing, and only by going back and working from the original master film materials can you ensure the best quality even a decade later. Number five, and most important in regard to keeping your work from becoming a missing movie, keep your paperwork like Nancy was talking about, and moving images materials together. Production and distribution contracts, music right clearances, cue sheets, lab bills, notebook, correspondence, scripts, scra scraps of paper, everything will be important to you years after you've made the film. Amy and I have found missing movies just by going over uh, notes, correspondence, even the scribbles of filmmakers on the side of a pad we help find a fine grain. Uh, we've been able to distribute films because past contracts proved that the rights had been returned to the filmmaker or the music rights were already cleared 30 years ago. When you donate or loan your moving images to an archive, the paper should go with them and be just as carefully preserved. Number six, and the final one, it's getting close. Know that there are a lot of people that can help you. That's the most important thing I'm talking about today. Everybody knows Martin Scorsese's The Film Foundation pays for film restorations. But there's also the National Film Preservation Foundation, Indie Collect in New York, The Lightbox in Philadelphia, New York Women in Film and Television, as well as dozens of nonprofit organizations, museums, and archives around the country. And if your film has a specific genre or a culture or something else, there are other people who can help pay for your preservation. Uh, the best place, again, is to start with the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Their website, amianet.org, is an incredible resource, as is their listserv that you can join for free. AMIA is nearly 1,000 members from around the world who work at archives, studios, indie distributors, academic institutions, and yes, even film collectors, directors, and cinephiles. Anyone who is interested in the preservation and access to moving images can join EMEA. Lastly, all of us at home missing movies bonded together because we have suffered a missing film. We can offer advice and in the future, hopefully pro bono legal, legal assistance. Finally, never give up on finding a safe home for your, for your movie. There are many local and national archives made up of people who love moving images as much as you do. Your movie, even if it's about a Maine lobsterman, is important and can find a place in the world. I'm basically here to be the comic relief. Uh, I'm a former distributor, or as I like to say, I'm a recovering distributor. And when you do this long enough, and you've worked on hundreds and hundreds of movies, and you realize that for all the various reasons that we've been talking about, that these movies are not available, that copyrights have expired, and companies have gone out of business, and you can't track this stuff down. First of all, it makes you feel really old. <laughs> and the second thing is that it's very gratifying when you hear, hear about folks that come in and restore these things and get them back into circulation. But also as a recovering distributor, I know that there are all sorts of <sighs> problems in, the, in the, the business models of the various outlets that are actually able to make these things available that make it very, very hard to keep things in circulation. And I'm going to touch on a lot of these things just briefly. It's a complicated thing to talk about because it's so convoluted. But um, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to just hit the highlights so that you can understand what we're up against. And then I'm going to try to at least push us in the direction of some of the things that we've talked about as possible solutions to the problem. I'm a huge believer in the fact that access to this stuff is just as important as making sure that things are restored or conserved or, um, or that the copyrights are cleared. And all that stuff is great, but the reality is that if you run into a problem and one of these things can't be cured, I'm a huge advocate that this stuff should still be available somehow, right? You know, like it, it should, should, shouldn't disappear. But there's an enormous amount of, of obstacles in the way of doing that. So, okay. First of all, a little bit of history. In my youth, when a film played in theaters and then ended its theatrical run, it was gone. There was no place else to see it because this was before home video, before VHS, before all this stuff. And television, which of course did exist at that time but wasn't what it is today, there was very little appetite for showing feature films on television. It was like a big deal in the late 60s when NBC for the first time had a prime time show that actually showed a feature length movie with commercials. Um, I remember that's how I saw my earliest Hitchcock movies was you know, on Saturday Night at the Movies on NBC. Um, see, I am old. So, you know, it w it's not as if the work that has been created by filmmakers over, the, over throughout history um, was always accessible. You know, it was actually really inaccessible at that time. But what's happened is that culturally, because of home video, we've gotten used to the idea that things stay in circulation, that they stay available. And what really irks me now is that while there were thousands and thousands of titles available on VHS, and then thousands of thousands of different titles that were available on DVD and ultimately Blu-ray, as we enter into the streaming world, there are less movies available that at, at any given time. And it's important to understand there's a reason for this. This is not just you know, these companies being fickle about what they're gonna put on, on, on their streaming services, because intuitively we think that you know, there's unlimited bandwidth and there's unlimited hard drive space and why don't they just throw it up there? Just, why, you know, why don't they just try to have everything? Well, the answer is there's this thing called licensing fees. When, when the, the, the transition from home video to streaming involved the fact that movies have to be licensed. And when they're licensed, they're licensed for a period of time. They have to keep you know, paying up year after year after year if they want to continue to have it on the service. And then on top of it, if you're talking about a film that's been made with any of the unions, there are residuals that are involved with that as well. So it means that having a film on the service actually costs them money. And that's the reason why, for instance, recently HBO Max announced that there was a whole bunch of stuff that they used to have on the service that they're pulling out. They're, they're not going to show it anymore, okay? So what happens to all this orphan material, all this stuff that, that you know, again, my personal feeling about it is I would love to see these things be accessible. And I feel very personal about it because having worked on so many movies in my life, I want those movies to be out there. It's, it's not, you know, I didn't make them so that they could sit in a vault someplace. I made them so that people would want to see them. So basically I haven't even looked at my notes. Um, okay, so um, we, we, you know, one of the foundational pieces of information that we base missing movies on is this mythology that people think that anything they want to watch is available at any given time. And the problem is getting worse by the day in terms of the number of things that are actually available. The number of services keeps multiplying, but the number of actual titles available is not multiplying. So this is just a way of saying that there is a fundamental problem with this movement in the business structure that's preventing a lot of work from being seen. So I, I do want to point out also, by the way, that when we talk about missing movies, you know, we, it, this has already been alluded to, the fact that we have a, like an internal debate among all of us about what constitutes a missing movie. 
And when we put the word out that we were doing this, we got so many emails from people saying, that's not missing, it's on YouTube. Or that's not missing, it's you know, available on Amazon on DVD for $150. Now, what, when, when something is $150 on Amazon, what does that mean? It means it's out of print. It means that the studio's not making any more DVDs of it. It's, they're, they're not interested in it anymore. So you're buying either a, you know, a packaged one that somebody had sitting somewhere, or you're buying a used one for $150. So the point is that little by little, as DVD and Blu-ray are a shrinking business, the number of titles that are actually still in print is also going down. So there's a lot of movies that maybe are technically available that maybe won't be available in the not too distant future. So, okay. Um, we, are, we know that in the early history of Hollywood that, and Dennis alluded to this also, that, that there have been many films that have truly been lost. You know, films, great silent films. Every time I listen to Karina Longworth's podcast, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but if you haven't checked it out, you should definitely check it out. Um, she's always talking about various movies where she's telling you the history of them, and then somewhere in there she slips in, but yeah, that movie's lost. You know, we, there's no way to see it. It's like, ah, well, you know, we're on the verge of potentially having another era like that where things are literally going to get lost because of these various things that we've been talking about not happening. So, all right. When I teach my class at Columbia, I, um, I begin the semester by asking the students why they're interested in making movies. It's a legitimate question because there are so many different reasons why people are doing the work that they do. And it can range from you know, just simply wanting to entertain people to having very personal stories that they want to tell to having an issue that they want to, you know, in part to people through the use of a, a, a movie. Um, and, and some people will actually say out loud that they want to do it to make money, uh, which is okay. You know, and and um, you know, I'm not going to judge anybody for their mo motivations. But the big point that I'm trying to make is that if, depending on why you're making the movies you're making, success is measured differently. And there are all kinds of movies that are made that are not suitable for the commercial market as, it's, as it develops. And those movies deserve to be seen even if there's no marketplace that can support them. And all the things that we've been talking about here, preservation costs money. You know, um, having lawyers to help you with your copyright issues costs money. And if there is no business model that can support the cost of getting something ready for to be put out in the world, what do you do about that? So, um, okay, hang on. I gotta find out <laughs> what I haven't said yet. Um, so, okay, so from my perspective, films fall into several categories. There are the ones that have stars in them and or have a reputation or have a well-known director or are in a genre that, for which there's a market, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, those films, there's probably a way to make money on them, and that's great. And, you know, there are really great companies that are interested in re-releases of older movies and are willing to put the money and the effort into it and to put it out in the marketplace. So that's great. Then there's another category of films for which there will be interest by um, institutions because of their cultural value, because they have something about them that is unique, representing specific types of people or specific cultures or, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And usually the support system for those movies is in the not-for-profit sector. I'm talking about grants and talking about um, there are distributors that are not-for-profit, um, though that's the sort of stuff that can help to support that. But then there are the th last kind of movies which don't fit into either of those two categories. And those are the things that really concern me personally the most. Things that are not really that commercial. Things that never really had much spin around them. 
things, but things that, and, and things that are not necessarily like front of culture, you know, to the point where there, you know, there's limited funds coming through these not-for-profits too, so where does the money come from? And those are the films that I feel like, in terms of my personal mission within this, I wanna try to see if there's a way to make those films available on an ongoing basis. And what I would call that, if, you, if you're a maker, if you've made work like this, um, there's no shame in not having had a commercial um, marketplace for your work. But you know, you've made it because you want people to see it. And the question is, what can you do with something like that? Um, and you know, I, I would like to, s you know, there are DIY things you can do, by the way, um, and I'm, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail about it, but there are ways in which people can make some money, some, not a whole lot, but some money, by self-publishing um, DVDs, by streaming through places like Vimeo has a, a way that you can stream and actually charge people to watch it. There are other services like that as well. Um, certainly the non-theatrical circuit exists for things like this. But um, that's a lot of work. And you know, honestly, the market is not that huge. So I would like to see a not-for-profit version of something like YouTube for people to be able to just cement their legacies. And I think, and I think of it as legacy more than anything else because obviously you don't do this for profit. But you do this so that your work survives. And with the hope that maybe someday, we'll, someday somebody will discover it, maybe it'll become relevant in a different way in the future. Um, these are things that I think are important. When PBS was first chartered, PBS was meant to do something just like that, which was to present to the audience things that are not being put into the marketplace by the commercial um, market. And I'd love to see the government support something that would allow people, and by the way, YouTube is not the solution because then all you're doing is giving Google the profits. Um, that, 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 that would be a bad idea. So um, that's, those are just some thoughts I'm throwing out there. Um, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Maya. Hi. <laughs> The film you just watched is Black Faces 1970, produced by the Sound Group Project of Studio Museum in Harlem and distributed by the Youth Film Distribution Center. This film is a montage of faces that comprised of this director's Harlem. In every film featuring black people, there is a social, anthropological, and aesthetic look at the changing face of cultural attitudes and norms. With black faces, we can glean that the director of this film believed Harlem to be a community with black faces, young, old, a varying color, and that fact was worthy of cinematic celebration. And each face you saw is a story untold, a legacy we can infer that may not have been written into the public cinematic image. When I think of missing movies, I think of stories untold, unheralded, and under underappreciated. Hi, I'm Maya Cade, the creator and curator of Black Film Archive, an evolving digital archive dedicated to expanding the knowledge of the abundant wealth of black cinema. Black Film Archive began in a place of curiosity. After the George Floyd protests of, 19, of 2020, <laughs> there was a very limited conversation about what was and, and could be possible for black film. Many conversations were focused on black film being limited in the scope of trauma. Instead of shaming people for what they did not know, I created blackfilmarchive.com as an offering to explore black cinema's past. Using decades, genres, and countries as a guiding post, Black Film Archive allows users to create their own map through Black Cinema's past. From my point of view, missing often means it exists outside of public consciousness. Black directors and film artists who may have taken their own film cans from theater to theater, or some version of that idea, have to continuously face new realities, whether it be their distributor going out of business, or being acquired by a distributor they did not license their film to, as was talked about earlier, not having the connections to have their film programmed in a theater or showcased at national cinemas or streaming services, or falling to general obscurity because they never received the investment in their work to make another film. 
Black Film Archive exists in the same way that counter, counter film festivals and cinema groups and archives championing cinemas from the margin have always existed to give their films, in this case, black cinema, a second life. In order to locate the films that are in the evolving archive that I create, I scoured available resources, physical and other digital archives, uh, notes that were on the internet from filmmakers, first edition of black film books, program notes from festivals of a bygone era, and deep corners of the internet. And together I pieced a history of black film for the first time. The future of black film and black film archive by extension requires films being in the public consciousness on streaming services and theatrical retrospectives and to have a degree of awareness from programmers, curators, filmmakers, film goers, and all that touch film. In order to protect black film's future, I implore everyone to remain curious. In order to preserve black film's future, we must first recognize the totality of its past. I will share and reiterate five things that I think we all can do to ensure that black film has a bright future. First, allowing curiosity to be your guide can, and it can lead you to places unknown. In 1983, in a Texas warehouse, a group of black films were discovered in a basement. The films now known as the, the Tyler Texas Black Film Collection opened up new avenues for black cinematic history and brought five previously un unnamed black films to the national stage. When you are curious and hopeful, bringing films back into public consciousness remains possible. Two, if there's a film you have seen, made, or have heard of that you have noticed that hasn't been mentioned in the public sphere in a while, get in touch with an archivist or a programmer. <laughs> we care. Black cultural heritage depends on film preservation and awareness. Three, many family members of mine are the original archivist in my life and have family videos and recorded, never to be air again, VH, VH, VHS tapes of TV films. <laughs> if that is a familiar story to you, consider transcoding the materials and consulting a librarian or archivist you trust in the process. Another thing we can do is tell your local art house cinema and favorite streaming service you would love to see more black films across genres and time programmed. Awareness is a constant impulse we must feed. And then five, I'd be remiss not to mention that Black Film Archive, in many ways, is a community project. If there is a black film that fits the current criteria, a black film streaming before 1989, that is publicly available and not listed on blackfilmarchive.com, feel free to get in touch. I am Maya at blackfilmarchive.com. And I, what I will leave you with is if we all remain curious, I believe that black films missing from public con consciousness will begin to be a thing of the past. Thank you. So now uh, we have a little bit of time set aside for some audience questions. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand and I'll call on you and then I, I will repeat your question back into the mic so everybody can hear it. All right, so I think what we're getting at is that um, under U.S. copyright law, once you create something and it's fixed, it's protected by copyright, but then you also want to register, usually, your copyright with the Library of Congress. And when um, what you would register is probably uh, the film, you know, once it's finished and, you know, ready to go to distribution or wherever you want it to go because you won't be making other changes to it that much. Um, but all the little components that you make all the way through it have copyright protection. But the final film that usually you, you view when you see a little copyright symbol at the end, um, that's if you wanted to deposit it with the Library of Congress, which actually is a great place to archive things if they keep it. Um, that's another question. Would be that one. And you can register that and just go to copyright.gov. They have uh, electronic registrations. Well, we'll start from the beginning. 
Um, as we, I said, any, any sort of creative input, like whoever holds a film will own a copyright to something, um, whoever writes a script will own a copyright, but that's why the film industry has contracts and generally it will end up that one entity will end up owning everything under work for hire or an assignment of copyright because it's very difficult to have 20 different people make a distribution deal. So typically by contract you have one entity that owns the copyright to the film. And so Tarantino's dispute with the NFT was he had a physical script with his annotations on and he wanted to make an NFT of that which would mean making a digital copy and selling it on the blockchain. Um, and the company that owned the film that he signed all his rights to was arguing that because they own the film, they also own that physical copy that has his notes on it. And they just settled that, so we're not gonna know the answer. But this is great, because I've always so said since that you know, $69 million Beeple deal, a day has not gone by when someone hasn't asked me an NFT question. So <laughs> there I, you go. we went through, I got one today. But so now, that's good. Just, just so I understand, so, they, so it was not about the script, it was about that that's, particular that's physical copy. That's my understanding. With his notes. Yeah. And the studio took the position that Yeah, they that owned since it. they owned the they script, owned they owned it. Wow. They owned it. They owned because that was his work product and they owned it. Yeah. So yeah, it's can I ask a follow up to that for the ownership? If it comes down to the producers, how do they decide who's the one single one that it, it, it's not yeah. uh, it's generally the predominant copyright owner. There has been disputes, in fact I think my law office handled one where someone uh, tried to stop a film, I think it was a director, because they never ended up signing the work for hire agreement. And the court looked at, there could really only be one, like one dominant owner. So. Thank you. Let's yeah, I, I just want to just clarify, because most of the time the producer is working for, everyone's working for a single purpose entity, entity usually an yeah. LLC. Yeah. So we all have contracts, the director has a contract yeah. with the LLC, whoever, and the financing structure kind of determines that ownership of the LLC. Um, yeah, if somebody gives you $10 million to make a movie, I'm pretty sure they're gonna own the majority of that, that LLC. So you, you, you know, in that sense, you're, you're, we're all working for people, we're, we're for entities. We're not on our own. But I mean, very, very, very few. Most of us think that Filmmakers own their films. Very, very few filmmakers. Uh, no. Own I, their yeah, I, I worked for Jim. Jar I, I did a movie with Jim Jarmusch, and Jim, I don't know what he's doing now, but at, to, oh, at the time, one? Ghost Dog, uh, and he, I produced Ghost Dog, and he owns the copyrights to at least to those or those but that's films. That's by contract. By, con to keep by contract, he won't he won't take the money unless he retains that copyright. Yeah, I mean, I think Household Saints was, uh, sure. I mean, the distribution agreements had expired. And, you know, again, with streaming is just a hard drive, right? It's just a, and, and these vaults at these studios have limited space. So uh, eventually, yeah, that could have definitely been. But now, can somebody answer that question about the, the Yeah. Do you hear when vaults toss movies and then they no, we don't, and that's really important, but I do have to say that Duart Film Labs in New York City was incredible in the way they contacted filmmakers to say, we've got your negative year, we're, and we're, when they were shutting down their, their lab services. So that's a really special um, ex exception, but often you don't know what's happening with your films. You don't know what's happening with your elements. We assume, we signed that contract, we assume that the big company in the sky that hired us to, we become work for hire, even if we initiate the story and we write it, once you sign up to get the money to get the movie made, then it, it belongs to a bigger entity than you are, and you just assume that for the rest of, you know, I thought I signed in perpetuity, blah, 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 so we were like, okay, and then you realize, oh, there's, there's limits to some of these contracts, and then there's people not knowing where things are anymore. But, but what, let's say uh, a film ball that realizes they can't keep something, wouldn't it make sense for them just to turn it over to the Library of Congress? Okay, now this is, yes, in theory, yes. But in practice, um, 
WPF, I think, was the lab in Pittsburgh that closed and everything disappeared and found 10 years later. Uh, other labs closed and just everything disappeared. Um, studios have gotten a lot better about keeping their materials. But I'll tell you about the difference between a lost and missing movie because it's been, I've been accused of being an optimist the last couple of weeks. And it's because my job over the last 30 years is when somebody assigns me to find a negative, I have to believe it exists or else I'm not going to find it because I have to go to the lab and say, you have my negative, maybe doesn't work. <laughs> you have my negative, work. So after about 20 years, I will believe it's a lost movie, that the negative doesn't exist. But that doesn't mean that I'm not looking for it in the 21st year. Uh, F.W. Murnau's uh, Four Devils. I'm still looking for it, though nobody has found it in 100 years. Uh, so a lost movie is a film, to me, where all the materials have been lost and it is impossible to see. A missing movie and the difference between, between us and Indie Collect and the Film Foundation is that we're focusing on the rights and helping filmmakers regain their rights and getting their materials to archives. We're not restoring the films for them. We're not paying for them. We're helping them with our experiences, with hopefully in the future legal advice that we will say, okay, let's go through your papers and let's see if we can help, res help you find your rights somewhere. Um, and, and even even movies that are considered lost from the silent era, every once in a while somebody opens up a, you know, a storage cabinet in some country and finds a print. You know, it's like it's yeah. crazy, but it happens. We bought a missing Paul Negri film on eBay two years ago, and it's being restored now. So you just never know. And also the Library of Congress, um, you can't just roll up with a tractor trailer and dump stuff yeah. with them. <laughs> That's right. you, they have to want it and they're selective because they have limited storage as well. I mean, they've, they've built um, a whole new storage place for a lot of film work, yeah. but it's not endless. Yeah, but they, they tend to be, if you have like five films, they say, and they're one of a kind, they're kind of, uh, they kind of want one of a kind things. I should also say, as I was talking about for home movies, there is a whole Center for Home Movies mov movement. The Center for Home Movies is one of my favorite people. And the Museum of Modern Art collects home movies. And you don't have to be famous, and it doesn't have to be. So there's homes for just about everything. You just have to be a good storyteller to tell them why you should store their films for you. For, for you. Is, is there a way that people who have film elements that they, that they can't afford to keep, can, can the incentives be created for them to, like that they, a lot of them, if they don't realize, can make money? Yeah, well, that's partly what we're doing and what the Association of Moving Image Archivists do. Yes, the whole, there is a whole idea of get these things out there, get them to archives, get them preserved. Yeah, I think great. we can go down the line and yeah. everybody has a movie they want to see. Looking for Mr. Goodbar which was a big deal for me when I was a teenager, and it's missing. Maya? Um, a Woman's Error is uh, one of the first films by a black woman from 1922, and it is presumed lost. Um, I, well, I, again, my definition, I'm a little aggressive on, the, on my definition of missing, because in, you know, in my view, if, if, you're not, if it's not streaming, a large part of it, population is not going to see it. I can't tell my kids to go watch a movie and they come, and, and it's on DVD. They don't have DVD players. We've, they've taken them from our computers. So I'm a little more aggressive, but in, in, in going through these lists, I mean, you know, movies that, uh, you know, movies like Huckberry Kid or Sleuth or, or Sugar Cane Out uh, is, a, is another movie, which is an amazing film and it's not, I, I there are other films we have a VHS of Sugar VHS, Cane Alley. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there are other films that are only available on an educational site for $300. Um, I don't have that available. available. Um, you know, or DVDs. I shot a New York all you can $65 for a DVD. You know. So, yeah. Oh, I should pass because yeah. I don't know which ones are missing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one that occurs to me is there was a movie that I saw for acquisition purposes back when I was working at Cinecom called Running Out of Luck, which was a British film directed by Julian Temple that starred Mick Jagger. And I love this movie, and it never got released. And I talked to both Julian Temple and his agent about, you know, like, can we ever get this film out? And they're like, we don't know where it is. We don't know who has the rights. We don't. It's like, whoa. So yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that movie again. Um, our friend Philip Haas, uh, he's a now an art. He's a recovering filmmaker. Now he's an artist. He made a film called The Music of Chance, which is based on a Paul Auster novel which I just thought was so brilliant, and um, it's unavailable. And we just spent 19 years acquiring a film that we've been dying for, but we can't announce it yet. But I will go with, I have been buy, I've been speaking to a certain pharmaceutical company about Heartbreak Kid mm -hmm. for the last six months, and the emails are going back and forth. So I would love to get them to donate their rights to an archive to get it preserved. Yeah, exactly, yeah. We saw, so. the, we saw a new leaf at that same series, that same Elaine May series, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot. There's so many. Well, we haven't really had a chance to discuss a lot of the details of what we're talking about right now because, frankly, the whole purpose of being here um, we're kind of launching this idea of turning this into a discussion. I mean, that's the whole point, is that we want to hear from other folks as well. We all have ideas, you know, that, we, that we're kicking around. Th I mean, there are online archives. The, the Smithsonian, the, well... The, the, Library, of Congress. the Library of Congress um, has, has America's one. Screening Room is, yeah, I think all, it's called. All the notes that I had that I didn't read. Um, the, uh, you know, there's the uh, archive.org, um, you know, but these are all things that at least they believe are public domain. And, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's a whole other layer to this, which is that, you know, I believe, and I think most of us believe, that we need to really tackle copyright law, ultimately. You know, if, if, if it's, you know, I, the way that I would phrase it is use it or lose it. You know, if, if it turns out that something's been on the shelf for 10 years and they're not making it available, then the copyright should just go into the public domain and you know, let it be available, let it be available. Now Google, by the way, tried to get something like that done for books, and, and they started digitizing every book they could get their hands on that they considered to be an abandoned copyright. No, they just, the problem was they did every book without every distinguishing. Every book, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they figured eventually they'd get around to owning everything, so. Right. But, yeah, and, but so there was now a, the public domain ones are there, but they were digitizing the- Everything, yeah. Everything, yeah. Yeah. even, you know, which, Publishers but the business. flaw, the flaw in that argument. I mean, if 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 Google were to say, we're going to digitize everything that we're talking about, as long as it's you know somehow abandoned, they could see it's abandoned or whatever. It sounds good, except when you realize that they put it behind a paywall and they're making money on it. You know, it's like so. So if 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 they, I mean, why should they be the ones to make money on it? The filmmakers, if anybody, should be the ones to make money on it. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I follow you on Twitter. I love the questions you put out there. Um, it's very. I follow you on Twitter. I like the questions you put out. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. thanks. But now you're, in a way, talking about marketing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's part of, um, you know, I, I, my, one of my mantras is that distribution is easy, marketing is hard. Um, you know, you can get things out to the world if you put your mind to it, but is anybody ever going to check it out? You know, um, you could create a website, but is anybody ever going to go there? You know, it, it's, there is that issue. You know, I, obviously one, you know, if you're talking about a massive archive of things that are available online, then it's got to be built around search. It's got to be built around metadata that points people to the things that they're looking for. Um, is there a better way of doing it than the way it's being done now? I sure hope so. And one of us have done that. Yeah, I would say I have a slightly differing opinion. <laughs> yeah. I think that preservation is a task for everyone. And the task, I think, of all of us here and all of us who care about the future of film is ensuring that everyone knows that. 
And I think I think of the films that I see as the extension of my family, and and Black American families uh, thinking about legacy is is at different point, points of your life, you you all have a task to ensure that people remember your family. So if I think of my the films that I see and the films that I, I now have in, uh, take, are now taken care of in a way, if I think of that as an extension of my family, then it is my task and to one, make sure that they're in the public consciousness, but secondly, ensuring that I can help other people develop this type of relationship to cinema. Yeah. And it, of course, doesn't have to be mine. And it's not that everyone's relationship has to be the same, but it is that, you know, the, how society sees cultures, uh, you know, if we think about history, when a film, a biopic comes out on someone, suddenly that's the record of that person. And it's only continuously moving in that direction. So it, they're very way, there are a lot of ways that to, to, to put people in and un making sure that they understand that <laughs> this is for them. Um, but it really is just harping on that, I think. I so agree with what you're saying. And I think that the, like, the work you're doing is, is a huge part of that and super valuable for that. And I think that one of the elements that we keep, we've kind of lost track of is education. Yeah. Uh, the appreciation of, of movies and, um, I teach at film schools and there's such an emphasis put on, and I'm not talking about uh, cinema studies, I'm talking about production. There's such an emphasis put on making, go out there and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And it's like, where are you getting your inspiration from? Like, are we looking back to our culture, to our people, to our stories, so that, like, so you, you gotta eat movies in order to go out and, and make them. So I think that that's really important in our education. I'm talking about even the littlest kids can, can watch film and appreciate these small movies or home movies or little docs or found films. We can teach that a lot of our history lies in these, in, in this, these found movies. So I think that's education's a big part of it. And I think we should say that, that we, do ch we can change culture. We do. We do. When we do this work, we do. Um, I mentioned Losing Ground. When we first brought Losing Ground out, boy, we couldn't get that film shown anywhere. It was finally shown here at Lincoln Center, and it was a really big hit. And then Kathleen Collins had died when she was 46 years old. But then um, her books have been published, and the books have been printed all over the world, and the films have gone around the world, and um, young black women filmmakers have been inspired by Kathleen's work. We don't know what we're going. You know, I always think that we're throwing, you know, little rocks into the water, and there are ripples. We don't know where those ripples are going to go, but we have to keep. We have to keep chucking them. We just have to. Hey, Gavin. I'll try to answer quickly since it's the last question. Uh, first, on some of the films you mentioned, I. I disagreed with them being on the list, but they have their own version of what's missing. And they're just as right, so they're, everything's open to bait. Second thing is, you are a brilliant person with a long, we've gone back a long time, so you have a lot of connections, and so you are able to find films. We all can't rent Heartbreak Kid from Bristol Myers Squibb. I'll just tell, tell everybody who it is. So that's another thing, but there are some of the films on our list that you can buy from Kino Lorber, that I would disagree on it, but since you can't easily see it on Netflix or even Kino Now or something else, they consider lost too. So missing movies is a really elusive thing, and I think we're just focusing on the major missing ones. Uh, Ujan Palsy is one of my favorite filmmakers, so I wish we had her. But in terms of HBO, Nancy has a missing film yes. on HBO. Availability and accessibility, and I think th uh, that's amazing. And you're, th if you're programming these films, then uh, yeah, I would seek you out. The problem, as I, I always go back to, is students that I teach in, at, at grad school. Uh, I did survey my my students, and of the 12 that I taught last uh, last semester, 11 do not have DVD players. Uh, one has one that his mother 
gave him. Uh, the, the, the DVDs is a 20-year-old technology. So in my opinion, and, and in my surveys of anybody under the age of 40, maybe, 35, um, they, don't see, they, they, they don't see films that way. Uh, we've been, um, spoke about marketing, we've been trained to want to stream things. That, that's the easiest thing. Hey, watch this show. You know, you can see 150 episodes all, you know, we can binge them for a month. Um, and I can do it now. There's a, you know, we've been taught this immediacy, and with these movies, looking for Mr. Goodbar, uh, if these walls could talk, Nancy's movie, not mine, but Nancy's movie on uh, that HBO NYC did back in 1996, you know, it's 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 about a it's about an interesting topic that people may wonder about abortion, uh, and it's not streaming, so sure, you know, uh, when someone asks her, how do I see your film? Um, or, or, or she's looking for, the, or she's try, we're trying to finance a movie, and a financier says, that's great. I know you did If These Walls Could Talk. Where, where can I see it? Well, do you have a DVD player? No, maybe I'll ship you one with a DVD. I mean, that's, to me, that's not, that, to me, that movie's missing. I mean, that's. And for me, it's, uh, we, uh, we just keep using the word, and, this, and like I said, we're all in, in a, some in agreement, some in disagreement as to what a missing movie is. But for me, it's accessibility, because I think of people in my family, I think of people, students that I teach, and just when, if you mention a film that you really want to share with someone, and, and I'm not being one of those old ladies that says back in the day, but back in the day, I'm going to say it, um, you know, I could go to the video store and if they didn't have it, I could ask my video store owner to buy it for me and I, could, I had so much access to more, many, 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 many more movies. And still then, so many were missing, including, you know, women filmmakers, black filmmakers, LGBTQ filmmakers, you know, th th they didn't make it to the transition to video. And then from video, some of us didn't make it to transition to DVD, and so on. So it's accessibility because our history erases itself if it's not accessible. And we forget who makes movies if it's not accessible. And just a very quick, on the depots that have all these thousands of films, Every archivist is chasing after these. Uh, I'm not going after Pacific Cinema's Cinerama films, but um, George Eastman Museum just bought in like a thousand prints of Pakistani films. Uh, Harvard just got, I don't know how many hundreds of Russian films in. So there are depots, there are these things. It's being able to physically and financially afford to bring them in and sometimes the owners want to keep them. People who have collab kept large collections. Yeah. Yes. No. Oh, uh, we were doing Legong Dance of the Virgins, and I couldn't find the second film. No, no, that's uh, 1914. Uh, I couldn't find the second film by Henri de Falaz, the count who married Gloria Swanson. I was walking at Cinefest and the guy said, oh, I got it. So yes, collectors have a lot of things. We're hoping collectors will will their collections to archives. I am sad to say a lot of those collections, the person dies, they get thrown out. I'm going town to Flemington, New Jersey, by the way. Uh, in a few weeks to look at another collection, I'm told, but. And then yeah. ultimately those films have to be, I mean, when we're really talking about accessible to the general public in all kinds of places, all across the world, all across the country, in little towns, in, you know, we, they have to be available in a different way. And Kyle wanted to ask something. We're, we're agreeing with both of you, really, to be we're, honest. We're totally agreeing. <laughs> and one of my fantasies is pop-up movie theaters, because I think we need more screen. We need more screenings. We need the, and again, accessibility, so that the work that you do can be shown in, in different places and places that may not have had seen anything like that before and get the next generation excited. 
I'm sorry to interject, yeah. but we are out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I just want to say... Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>